That would be the U.S. and Egypt brokering deals, pressuring Israel to allow more humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip. But the big question of fuel is still unanswered, as Israel vows not to allow any fuel in that will allow Hamas to power its military. But the world is ratcheting up pressure on Israel to allow exactly that in. So to answer just what sort of energy capabilities Hamas has right now, we are joined by Dr. Eli Rettig, Assistant Professor at the Department of Political Studies, bar -Lan University. Thank you for being with us. Let's talk about energy infrastructure in Gaza right now, because we're also hearing that there are massive fuel stockpiles that Hamas is using. Yes, so on a regular day before the war, around 50% of Gaza's electricity is coming straight from Israel. And the rest is generated mainly by a big diesel-powered power plant uh, that generates around 25%. And the rest is just a widespread of privately owned small-scale diesel generators in hospitals, in water desalination plants, uh, and in people's homes that they generate electricity and sell to their neighbors. It's a very unregulated market. And a lot of solar panels with their own uh, battery capacity, uh, which means that uh, Generally, even if Israel uh, cuts off electricity to Gaza, it still has around 50% of its own capacity, but only if it still has diesel fuel. The problem is that on the first day of the war, Hamas um, depleted all of the diesel fuel from the power plant. So the power plant shut down immediately, uh, which leaves Gaza with very little electricity. The hospitals, uh, anyone who has small-scale diesel generators, and of course, Hamas bases, underground bases, they still have electricity, but only the, the few people that have access to Hamas and Hamas diesel fuel uh, have that uh, capacity. And before we continue this discussion, we're going to let you hear directly from people inside Gaza a phone call showing exactly that, Hamas's stockpiles and how they took the fuel on the first day. Let's play that first. <laughs> Turn to you now, Dr. Redig, because the big question is, we, we heard on that phone call there, something in the area of a million liters comp of diesel confiscated, about a half a million liters of diesel underground in Hamas's tunnel networks, roughly 1.5 million total if we're combining those numbers there. How long can they operate on 1.5 million liters of diesel? It's very hard to assess because the question is how much they release to the hospitals, to humanitarian uh, uh, concerns, which I assume very little or not at all. Um, and it's very hard to assess because we don't really know the full capacity of these, we call them tunnels, but it's really an underground city uh, under the under Gaza. They need ventilation systems, they need electricity, they need communications. Um, I assume uh, in preparation for an operation like this, Hamas has stockpiled a lot of diesel in the underground bunkers, not just in the silos that you see from the satellite images. And I assume they have enough electricity for months ahead. Dr. Reddy, I know this is not simply analysis to you and we're talking about this war. I understand that you have a personal story of loss from this conflict as well. Well, I have a lot. Everyone in Israel does. I have colleagues and, and students that were killed on October 7. Um, one of them is uh, Woy Levy. He was uh, Colonel Woy Levy. He was the commander of a, of a commando unit, a 
a bona fide war hero. He was injured in Gaza a few years ago, recovered, decided to go back into war. Um, I didn't know anything about that. I mean, I knew him as my student. Uh, only after he died, I realized he was a very uh, top secret commando. You, know, you, you couldn't guess that about him. He was a brilliant student and very kind. And his final paper was about energy cooperation between Israel and the Palestinians. He wanted uh, to help um, uh, have the Palestinians have their own energy generation capacity, assuming that will create more trust building between the sides. He wanted a better future for both sides. And, and that's how I knew. Uh, I only discovered he was a war hero after the fact. That's, that's how humble he was. It's a moving, touching story, Eli. I think all of us are hoping that there are better days and more peaceful ones ahead. Thank you for joining us and for helping us understand the situation there as well.